Okie dokie, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining this Agile webinar, or not webinar, it's a meetup, right? So uh, quite excited about it. We'll let everyone join. It usually takes a few minutes or, you know, a couple minutes uh, for everyone to, uh, to join, get their microphones set up, or not microphones, I guess everyone's muted, but the uh, audio set and, and what have you. So um, really excited about this event today. Um, we have a great great uh, agenda for you. We have Jed with us. And and uh, when I was at old CTB at Citrix, um, we always loved it. We'd have these meetings once, uh, uh, maybe a couple times a year, but at least once a year at Synergy or iForum. And, and Mark Templeton would come and talk with us. And it was always the high point of our, our uh, event because you got to hear from the man himself, right? And uh, Mark would usually talk for a few minutes and then just open it up for Q&A. And uh, we sort of got to pester him about all the things we loved and all the things we hated and all the things we wished for, right? And uh, you want to see a, a you know a, a lively bunch and you know bring a bunch of techies into a room and let them loose, right? So uh, I'm really excited today uh, to have Jed with us because that's what we get to do is sort of treat him like Mark because he is Mark to us, right? And uh, um, for IGEL and he's done great things here at IGEL and and uh, I got to, I joined the company about six months after Jed did. And so I got to watch all the changes that he brought into the company. And and uh, uh, it's just been an absolutely bla a blast for me uh, as a you know late 40s guy um, to, to get to go through all this fun again. It's, it's really been you know a true treat. So I'm really, really excited to have him. Uh, you know, I'm way ahead. I, I guess I should probably, you know, I would, this is part of my slides, I guess, but uh, for those that are joining and got to hear that. So uh, so we'll uh, bring Jed on, then we'll move over to Christian. Uh, but uh, also we have a lot of, uh, you know, this is a QA. and a So please, if you have any questions, please ask them. Use the, the questions piece. Uh, if you're having any troubles with anything, please say it in chat. If you just want to chat, you know, please uh, let's have a lively event. These are meetups. Uh, these events are for you. It's not a webinar in the sense of we just want to preach to you. It just wants to be a give and take, right? So let's have some fun um, and let's have a, you know, a very lively event. So that being said, I think we have, uh, it's a couple of months. I sat there and chatted for four minutes and I can't shut me up. So uh, four minutes and you got 44 people on. Good job. Yeah. So it's always interesting to see. Uh, we had over 100 people register, and usually about 50% is a good uh, um, is a good outcome. I'm trying to share my screen. And we have a lot of people that register for the, the for the video. Okie dokie. So we'll get going here, and we'll make this official. So first of all, thank you all for joining. Uh, we have a really lively event for you today. Um, it's going to be great. If I seem a little bit down, my back is killing me. So I'm not my lovable self. Not that I was ever lovable to begin with. Uh, I'll ramble here for just a couple more minutes, and then we'll turn it over to Jed. Uh, like I said, we do have Jed Ayers, our CEO at IGEL, with us uh, to take Q&A from you guys. And I could not be happier about this. Uh, I'm really excited to see what you guys have to, you know, the questions you have. So uh, please use the Q&A piece and we'll ask those. Um, and then we have a bunch that were also pre-submitted. So we'll go through those too. And then we have uh, Christian with us and he's one from one of our experts from advanced services. And uh, this guy knows as much about IGEL as anyone. Um, so he's gonna do a deep dive into IGEL uh, deployment best practices, which I'm really looking forward to. That being said, we do have upcoming events. We do de do these meetups once a month. So um, the next one uh, we have, I'm really excited to have Dennis, the senior pro program manager for RDP and WVD with us. And he's going to be doing a, uh, a deep dive session into both of those technologies and also taking your questions. Uh, I slated that for an hour and a half. So usually we do a two hour event, uh, one month and then an hour event the next month. But Dennis is just a wealth of knowledge. The guy's as technical as anyone I've ever met. And uh, um, you know, WBD and what's happening over Microsoft is, well, it's the future. So we wanted to make this one a little bit longer and, and uh, open that up for as much Q&A as you guys want. And also give uh, Dennis the time to dive deep into his subject. In September, we might have Microsoft back, we might not. 
uh, that's up to you guys. So please let me know what you think. These events are for you. So if you have any suggestions whatsoever, you know, post them in the community, email me, brown at igel.com, and we'll make your dreams come true. That note, the last thing I wanted to say is uh, definitely if you're not a community member, please join us. Uh, we have a lot of fun in Slack. Uh, um, we're all closing in on 4,000 members, believe it or not. We should do that maybe tomorrow or definitely next week. But we do have a great website with a bunch of resources up there too. So uh, check out igelcommunity.com. And then of course, sign up for future events at uh, igelcommunity.com forward slash events. You'll see those. Uh, or of course, you'll see them in the Igel community in the announcements channel and in the events channel. So with no further ado, let me stop sharing. Let me turn over to the floor over to Jed, and uh, and then we'll get to uh, get to some Q and A. So, um, Jed. Well, thank thanks, Doug. Uh, great to be with you. Hello, everyone from uh, Northern California. I'm here in uh, my home office in uh, Marin County, which is just north of the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, yeah, obviously a huge honor and pleasure to be uh, with the IGEL community uh, today very special group and uh, certainly I thank all of you uh, that are part of the uh, the IGEL community and the greater end user compute community um, for, for being being on today. Um, Doug, you, you mentioned uh, my name in the same breath as Mark Templeton when uh, we started off this and that, that's obviously a great honor. Uh, he was a role model for me. I remember when I walked into the end user compute community, I think it was 2004, uh, in the Swan and Dolphin, I walked into the back of uh, a, a room with, you know, whatever it was, 6,000 people at the time, and it changed my life. And certainly Mark as a role model and somebody that, um, you know, led, led a, a great movement um, and a great company uh, around this technology, watching that ha happen, you know, from uh, their original quest to a billion dollars to, to where they are today. Uh, it was a, it, it's been an amazing ride. And course along the way lots of great friendships formed and uh and then we find ourselves here today so i guess first of all i just want to say i hope all of you out there are feeling uh healthy and safe and uh this is certainly an unprecedented time um i know there's probably a fair number of europeans on the call and uh you know congratulations to all of you who have done so well navigating you know through this health crisis obviously in the u.s we're uh we're still, um, you know, fighting to get it under control. So, um, for me personally, it's kind of a crazy moment because my daughter um, was accepted to the University of Miami. She, uh, of course, is now struggling with should she go to the epicenter of this this uh, epidemic and do her first year there. So it's a it's a big topic here as uh, as Miami starts to look like Wuhan, right? Um, in terms of the uh, the outbreak. So obviously, this is very personal. It's kind of an emotional time uh and you know i know i saw many of you in nashville i saw a lot of you in uh in munich and i don't think anyone could have predicted you know what's happened in the last few months right um it's it's just unprecedented so uh, i guess my my best wishes to all of you uh that are you know uh, dealing with the sort of changed changed world that we all live in um it's it's just uh not expected and uh, certainly I think challenging in so many different ways. Um, and it's certainly challenging to be uh, running a, an organization where I took over February 6th and uh, two thirds of our employees actually um, are in Europe. So um, not only can I see the ones in the US, but uh, I uh, promised all the ones in Europe that I'd be right back <laughs> to spend lots of time with them. So that, uh, as you can imagine, has been a challenge. I, I don't think I could go to Europe today if I, if I wanted to. So certainly a new world order. Um, and I, I thank you all for, uh, for kind of, um, you know, being part of, uh, of this. And I think, you know, change is, uh, it, it's in agility. It's like the new superpower, right. To be able to navigate through th this, this unprecedented, you know, thing. There's a lot of things in the world that have affected me in my lifetime, but nothing, as dramatic as what COVID has done in the speed and the, the breadth of what it's, what it's done. I think we're going to live with this for a long time. I guess how I see it affecting, you know, what we do is it feels like, you know, um, the technology we, we deliver has been right in the middle of this, right. In terms of how people have been able to pivot, work from home, um, and continue to have continuity in their businesses. Right. Um, 
I think this crisis would have been a lot worse if we would have had, uh, you know, we wouldn't have had some of the cloud delivered technologies and the, uh, the, the capabilities that we have to flex uh, for people to, to work anywhere on any device, right? Um, this is, this made it possible for this crisis to not be worse. So um, I guess what I would say to all of you is that your skills and your participation, I mean, you may not see it day in, day out, but I, I would have to believe that um, you're part of the, uh, the effort to keep uh, a level of normalcy and keep the economic impact of this and, and the, the livelihood impact of this to be uh, lessened. I can say at IGEL, uh, our number one vertical is healthcare. And so it's amazing to me to see, you know, um, how our teams are rallying to help the people that are truly helping the, the, the people that are in the most need here through this. Um, so I guess that keeps me very buoyant every day, waking up and realizing that, hey, um, the dark arts of end user compute, right? Uh, the sort of minority use case that we might have all been living in, right? A hundred million workspaces out there deployed, maybe 10% of any organization would have had this technology. Suddenly we're, we're like right in the middle of it is what I would suggest to you all. And uh, certainly the, the, the technology is around DAS and, uh, and cloud delivered desktops. I think this is just gonna take off in a way that you know, no one could have predicted. Um, I know we had Scott uh, Manchester talking about um, you know, his success back in February in launching WVD and how they were ahead of plan. And then maybe you, those of you who uh, were tuned in to Disrupt last uh, couple weeks ago, you know, we had the new owner of that group talking about how they're eight times uh, ahead of what, they're, what the, that they thought they would be at this point. Of course, Microsoft will report their earnings in a, in a few days here, and um, I'm sure... Yeah, we'll see very clearly uh, that the cloud delivered, Azure delivered solutions are going to propel Microsoft to even you know better place. Uh, so I guess I, I just uh, bring it back to IGEL and I, I think about what we're trying to do day in and day out. And, uh, you know, your your community here, Doug, has been very helpful to us as we try to figure out how to become a better company, better deliver a better product. Um, we listen to you. I think that's one of the key differentiators for IGEL, right? We love to listen to the people that um, have perspectives and have opinions on how we can deliver a better product. And, you know, Doug, you and I had a breakfast, I guess, almost four years ago where we talked about you joining IGEL and, you know, what you could bring to the table. And, uh, you know, certainly this has exceeded any uh, of my wildest dreams um, in terms of the thousands of people that are a part of this Slack community uh, that, that join, you know, events like this and, uh, and are helping us build an innovative product. Um, I hope at some point in the near future, you have um, Christian Werner on to, uh, to deliver the, uh, the roadmap for IGEL, like in detail, because I know you have a lot of technical people on this. I had the pleasure of sitting in a QBR uh, this week with our European team and, and watching him deliver this, uh, this roadmap. And I can tell you in the four years I've been here, or in fact, at any point in any company I've worked at, this was probably the most impressive flyover of de delivering on, on innovation that I've seen. And to do it with the small team that we have in Germany, it sort of speaks to the, uh, the German uh, rigor and efficiency and the sustained you know, focus that this team has had for two decades on building this product. So um, I guess I'll shut up at this point, Doug, and just say, uh, you know, I think the real interesting part of this is born out of the, the questions and kind of the ask me anything. I'm glad I have two of our smartest engineers <laughs> um, flanking me here because uh, I certainly don't have all the answers technically. Um, but that's what uh, that's what it takes, right? It's a village. We all come to uh, the table with different skills. Um, so uh, anyway, I guess I'll, I'll shut up, Doug. And I just want to say thank you to everybody that joined, and uh, thank you for being part of the community and uh, part of the, uh, the the population that's working through this. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Jed. Uh, um, yeah, I remember uh, joining uh, IGEL, and I told the I told Jed and Heiko that I wanted to build a community. And 
one of the things that's been so nice is that Judd's been, uh, um, he's supported us. He's never told us no, and he financed it and let us do these crazy things that we do. And when you look back on it, you could say, okay, there's a lot of value there. But when you were, you know, day one, the, you know, only the few people see the value and, you know, the crazy techies out there. So uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, we did have Christian Verter in the first, uh, our May meetup. Uh, which was okay. a really great meetup. So if anyone's listening out there and you weren't in the May one, definitely go to igelcommunity.com, uh, go to the blog, you can find that video or go into the announcements channel uh, um, and you'll find that video in there. A really great session. Also, Sebastian did a great session in that one on custom partitions. So let's get to uh, let's to get to Q&A. You know, the first question I wanted to ask you is was a question that was submitted and uh, you talked about this a little bit, but I will ask it because I'm very, very selfish in this one. And what do you see the value? You talked about the community having a lot of value, but what do you see the value of the IGEL community and, and how does this directly help IGEL? Well, I mean, I guess, first of all, like just the fact that um, in a world that's gone virtual, you know, that um, we've created this, you know, really efficient way to have conversations, you know, the way that the channels are organized and uh, the fact that, um, you know, we have people using the mobile app and logging in and, you know, have reason to do that every day in a world that has gone virtual uh, to be able to stay connected in a world where, you know, I wasn't able to hug everybody at, at Synergy and VMworld and Nutanix next this year. Right. And, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So, I mean, I give you all a big virtual hug um, right here. Um, so I think, you know, that's the first part of this, right? It truly is a community. We're here to support each other. Uh, we drive something at IGEL called a servant heart, right? Which is this idea that, you know, hey, um, you win when you're kind and you do things out of the spirit of helping others. And I think that's part of what the community is about, right? Like you have these people like Sebastian. I mean, his job isn't to support the community, but you would think like that's what his job was, right? Because he's always on, he's always there trying to figure out how can he help somebody, you know, do something. Um, and that's the spirit. That's actually one of the cultural ethos at IGEL, right? Is, is this idea that one, believe that we have a place in the future and we can do the impossible. And secondly, you know, how can we serve? Um, and, you know, by the way, that comes to serving each other. You know, inside of our own organization, there's a very family oriented kind of mantra, but it's also about our partners and ultimately our customers. So, um, you know, the community is an extension of that every day. Um, and, and obviously, uh, the most important heartbeat of any tech company is innovation. And I have to believe that um, part of why we have such a good product is we listen with both ears. And now we have a forum to listen to you, the smartest people. Um, in the world on this technology that are on the front lines, you know, deploying this and seeing, Hey, if I gel could only do this, or if you built this into the product, we could be, um, you know, helping, uh, deliver something even more extraordinary. So I think that's the key, right. Um, is, is that you're a, a very important conduit directly into the, into the product pipeline development. Hopefully that answers your question, but I'm, I'm one of the biggest champions of your, what you guys are doing bar none. Um, and yeah, I think ultimately as, as we, every company that software company is trying to build customer experience, customer journey, great customer interactions and intimacy, the community is, has been, is an important leg of that, right? The, it just, it's a, it's a table stakes in terms of how you want to interact with customers. No customer wants to call, pick up the phone and call and wait on hold and work through some phone tree to answer a question. If they can get it answered by their peers um, directly in seconds, um, or they can search for threads of, of content, you know, all the better. Yeah. Thank you. Self-medicate. <laughs> yeah. Everyone wants to self-medicate. It's Jed's famous uh, way to explain the agile community. It's so true. Then I would like to ask one question we get quite often for the moment in the community, I would say since the Raspberry Pi 4 was launched and I must ask, which plans do we have on Agile for ArmOS? Yeah, so I think Agile obviously has been watching the arm, you know, uh, arm race, if you will, uh, for very closely for for years now, right? And the first iterations of the Raspberry Pi, you know, we deemed as very challenging to to deliver a great experience. Agile's always been focused on like how do we deliver the you know really high performance, high security, high manageability, but ultimately the guy who has to sit behind that device. Can it be 
you know, delivering a, a high, high level enterprise experience. And I think it wasn't until the Raspberry Pi 4 arrived that we were like, all right, we finally got to a form factor and a processing power that you don't need 42 dongles and a PhD to get uh, a configuration that might actually work. And so, um, you know, that's really where we started to double down in Augsburg with the team to, to, to figure out, all right, how do we, how do we take this, you know, IGEL OS that's so, uh, yeah, we you know, perform so well on an x86, how do we get it on, onto a Raspberry Pi 4? And I think before the end of the year, you'll see the result of that. Um, you know, and, and I think that sometimes it's great to be on the front end of a market, uh, and, and lead, um, but other times, you know, it's, it's important to kind of sit back and make sure that, um, that there's an appetite. I will say the big breadcrumb for me on this too is, is what Apple did, right? A couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, where, where they're headed. And certainly when you think about the whole architecture that we're delivering, right, out of the cloud, all the processing speed can run on x86 in, in Azure or Amazon. And ultimately what we want on the edge is a power sipping, you know, highly tuned, inexpensive chipset, right? That um, gives us that hundred, two hundred dollar device um, that you can pick up, and you got, you know, they're, they're just laying around, hopefully, right? Um, so that that's kind of how I see it, and I just would tell everybody in the audience, thank you for your patience. I know a lot of people have been frustrated about the the Citrix, uh, you know, hub and the casting and you know where, where does iGel fit into this i just would ask you to be you know patient for a few more clicks i think you're going to see some things that will make you very happy well i'm very excited about that pi is one of the things i wanted when uh when i joined uh um but you know i'm way ahead of, you know i don't know about heading the good part but you know uh, um i think we, we've done it right sebastian did you have a follow-up there no that's fine Okay, so I've uh, uh, Jed, you had mentioned uh, uh, Christian Werner and talking about the roadmap, and we had a question around around that. Uh, are there any products on the or features on the horizon that excite you? And when you looked at Christian's roadmap, what did you say that wow, this is really exciting beyond the ARM stuff? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess part of what I'm looking at is just the totality of what these guys are delivering, right? And um, obviously, there's some, you know, we 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 were like, try to fancy ourselves as a, an operating system and a software company. There are some things we're doing in the hardware space. Hopefully everybody on the call is aware of the new UD3 and the work that we've uh, done to bring that to market, right? Um, we're, we're planning on a new UD7. Uh, it will be inside that same slim down form factor. It'll have the uh, high-end AMD Ryzen chipset. It'll um, you know, have the ability to run four monitors and all, all the you know kind of ports and everything that you want, right? So I think we continue to want to uh, deliver a super high-end kind of aspirational thin client form factor in the smallest you know uh, enclosure that we can possibly do it. Of course, I like the fact that our enclosure is now 50% smaller, but it's also made from entirely you know recyclable materials. Um, you're going to see some improvements, obviously, in some of the challenges we've had in Wi-Fi. And Bluetooth in the in this new UD7, you'll see it come out at the beginning of next year. Planned for uh, for disrupt 2021. Hopefully, we'll see you all in person. Uh, we have had an unprecedented demand for the um, the UD Pocket. I mean, I'm just we're seeing it all over the place. That's just sort of you know people you know come to grips with. Hey, I could plug this thing into you know. Uh, thousands of devices and uh, be up and running in my workflow connected and um, you know, on, on existing hardware that's sitting out there. So uh, one of the challenges there has been we didn't have the USB-C. Uh, so we, we're in the final stages of evaluating um, and you know, getting all of the, uh, the mechanics of how to deliver the OS on a USB-C thumb drive. So um, I think you'll see that um, you know, in the near future. Um, obviously, the, the next um, version of the iGel OS, the 11.04, um, it's, uh, it's pushed to, to early August. You're going to see a whole lot of really good uh, things that are timely uh, uh, inside of that release. I would say Teams and WebEx are probably the two most important. Sorry. The uh, challenges of not turning your phone off. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, you know, the, the, you're going to see a bunch of innovation um, 
packed into this new update that will come in August with the 1104, right? Um, mainly that the, uh, you know, the Ubuntu update is going to happen around 1804. I know that's something that a lot of people have asked about for a while. So that, that will be the long time support guarantee uh, around that new Ubuntu release. Um, I, I, I would have to say, and then you're also going to see uh, the Chromium browser integrated. Um, that's a, a big one. I mean, I, I would just say the list goes on and on. That's why I kind of asked uh, if, if uh, maybe all this was covered when Christian came in on in May. But I mean, it's kind of amazing to me. Yeah, you, know, you got Control Up will be uh, baked into into the 1104. All the enhancements that have happened uh, with Windows Virtual Desktop. Uh, you know the the full uh, support uh, inside of Citrix Workspace app uh, for Teams and the whole offloading that happens there. So there, there's a lot coming, um, you know, in 11.04. And I guess that's the part that just like kind of blows my mind when I look at, um, you know, the, the just the it, it goes on and on, right? Um, and, and I'm happy to like even drop it into the uh, into the um, the chat window, but like the the, the the um, client updates alone, I'll just put them right in here, here in the, I don't know if I can cut and paste, actually, it doesn't allow me to do that. Um, but wow, the, uh, the, the the client updates, I'll do a screenshot, I guess, is what, probably the best way to do this, right out of uh, Christian's, um, his uh, update he did this week. I'll, I'll drop it into the chat so you guys can all see it there. Hopefully it'll work. Let's see here. Maybe not. I think Doug, you've got you got some kind of a setup that doesn't allow for, it, but happy to maybe just pull it up on the screen if you want. I was talking. I was on mute. Why don't you just send it to me and I'll send it out in the uh, in the uh, yeah. After. I mean, oh, the, 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 this is uh, the, the, these are the client updates that are coming inside of uh, eleven oh four, and this is I think August fourth is when they're planning. I mean, I think this this also speaks to. Um, you know, the level of innovation packed into that operating system, just, um, you know, all of these clients kind of keeping them curated. I mean, I, I don't know if your audience is kind of aware, but, you know, 85% of the Agile OS is snippets of code uh, from, you know, 90 plus different technology partners we work with. And I mean, this slide right here is a great you know, showcase of that. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, I, I'm I'm pumped about that uh, that update. I guess the other thing I would say is the um, the update around the um, the web client for for the UMS. While it's not going to do everything that the you know the core Java client can do today, the idea that um, we're moving you know a, a step function closer to being able to to pick up um, and manage that through a web browser, uh, you know that's that's an important step for the company. Um, you know, people don't, no one wants to, you know, ha have to manage an on-prem or even off-prem deployment of uh, a management console today. So certainly we're, you know, this thing has gotten so powerful and there's so many uh, things that can do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a huge work effort to lift all that into the, uh, into the cloud. But I'm very excited that you're going to see that, um, you know, here in July, you'll see our first iteration of this web client um, for UMS. So uh, stay tuned for that. That covers more or less already the question I would have asked just after that, because in the number of uh, clients you already shown uh, in your presentation is, why is Agile fitting in a work from home world? Um, that question came mostly from, I would say, people which are still seeing Agile as a sync client vendor, or let's say really as a pure hardware vendor, and not a software vendor we might uh, have become since a few years. So what is your, well, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I guess, you know, we try to uh, really position ourselves as a software company. And yes, we build thin clients, but um, first and foremost, we're an operating system, a thin operating system, an edge operating system for cloud workspaces. So, um, you know, I think when you think about uh, what we talked about at the beginning of this, Sebastian, with like a, the world, how, they, how they've sort of uh, got religion suddenly on cloud delivered applications and desktops, this is what saves the day. And um, you know, now as everyone sort of realizes, okay, I also need to be able to manage these. I need to be able to secure these. I need to make sure that all the performance works, all the peripherals work. 
you know, that, hey, headsets and printers and scanners and things that I never would have thought would might sit in someone's house, they all need to, to work, right? So that's where I, I, I would say, I gel as, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the first to say, hey, I'm the guy who start. I, I work in three different places around my house in, uh, in any given day, right? Because I don't want to wake up my family. I kind of have a routine. If it's sunny, I might even go outside to get some fresh air. So I think uh, we're seeing this in our customers more and more. It's like, hey, a mobile, a mobile form factor versus a hard, hard and thin quiet um, is probably the, the way to go, right? And okay, so then think about this as sort of a, you know, the, it goes back to our ARM conversation, right? Uh, uh, a Chromebook like you know uh, device that runs on ARM that can can consume these Windows. Um, applications uh, or Windows desktops, that to me is um, nirvana. And it can do it in a high performance, high fidelity way, it can be secured, it can be managed. And it's not as unwieldy as, you know, um, as, a, as trying to manage Windows 10. It's funny to me, uh, Sebastian, the other thing I'd say is I see a lot of people today, today that are, you know, have embraced the cloud, but they're still sitting on like a $2,000 laptop. And that laptop's running Windows 10. It has all kinds of challenges with security and manageability. And then you look at it and you're like, what do you actually have on that device? Uh, that you act, Like what files do you have on it? And they're like, well, nothing. I, I have nothing on it, right? So does it really need that ridiculous processor and uh, huge operating system? My, uh, my belief is no. <laughs> and that's obviously why I have so much conviction about what iGEL's doing. But it's about the OS. It's about the OS, I would say. You know, Jed, I agree with you. I, I've been selling and supporting and evangelizing Citrix for, you know, 20 some years. And what I never understood was why, you know, the benefits of Citrix are immense or Citrix style solutions, Citrix VMware, Microsoft, whatever, remoting. And why would you want to have an existing machine there, you know, like a the Windows, the existing type of client server device. It never made any sense to me. It went counterproductive of what they were buying into this idea of remoting. But no. um, so this is why I like thin clients. And on that line, you know, what, what did you see uh, in iGel that made you join the company? And what do you see today that makes you want to stay with the company? Well, I mean, I think it always comes down to human beings, right? At the beginning, every relationship and and a lot of motivation that people have in life, it's you can kind of draw a straight line back to a human um, relationship, right? So my initial, uh, you know, outside look at iGel and a lot of other people that I trusted and were mentors, you know, they looked at iGel and they were like, "This was in twenty beginning of twenty sixteen, and it was like, "Hey, run! How fast can you run away from this?" You know, it's uh, German, thin, you know, hardware. At the time, VDI was a bit under siege. If you remember, Citrix had four CEOs in four years, and Elliot was crawling into the both VMware and Citrix. Um, so, yeah, I, I think um, it, it was a little bit foggy until I met Heiko, and we had this famous four-hour dinner outside of London uh, where we opened a restaurant and closed it. Um, and um, I started to hear from him what his vision was. And it actually goes back to what we just talked about. It was the operating system. It was the converter. It was the fact that he had this UD pocket that, you know, hadn't seen the market yet, but he'd never been able to articulate it correctly. Part of it, I think, was the fact that it was in German. All the marketing was in German. It was very technical. Um, and so, yeah, I, 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 what, I, what got me excited was, oh, wow, there's a transformation to a software uh, you know, and, and something that needs to be told in the U S this was a company that had done really well in Germany had been number one for since 2006, but had never really properly, they had actually failed a couple times coming to the U S. So for me, I looked at that and saw, Oh, this is something that no one, no one thinks is possible. Uh, that it's sort of like buying the you know, fixer upper house, right. That then suddenly becomes highly valuable. Um, so that's that I love it when people don't see something and that's kind of, it was a huge ambitious, you know, um, thing. And a couple people had failed at it. it so people have realized that the best way to motivate jet airs is tell them that you can't, this can't be done. Um, and so I, uh, I take great pride in one of the guys I worked with at AppSense, the CEO of AppSense, very smart guy, um, you know, um, McKinsey, Stanford, 
Duke. Every quarter, I, I text him how we're doing. Um, and yeah, he's one of the people that said, this is a questionable career move. So um, anyway, it's been a very fun ride. And I guess, yeah, uh, what, that's, that's why I joined. But under, underlying all that is just the passion of the people that would work here. Hopefully I answered your question, Doug. <laughs> yes, you did. Yeah, I think you asked me what I see that wants me to stay today. I guess I would just tell you the transformation of IGEL is not over. Um, we have, we still have, you know, a lot of innovation to deliver. We still have, we want to get onto subscription. Uh, we want to get onto ARM. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we have a, a lot of opportunity to continue to drive awareness into the large enterprises. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity to become a global company. You know, today we're really kind of a U.S., Europe, European company. So, yeah, there's still just tremendous upside. Um, yeah, we have aspirations to build this to a billion dollar company. Thank you. Then I would take the next one. Um, since we are going more into the direction of a full blown operating system, but let's say a secured operating system, uh, we have a question regarding the custom partition topic, which is still following us uh, since years, I would say, at least for myself. Uh, we have the custom partitions are very powerful. I see the agile community is trying to make it simpler with custom partition templates. Do you see a day, or a day sorry, where agile uh, will have an official app store or let's say a kind of app store because uh, downloading custom partition might be a way, but we have all the technical um, ideas we could follow on that topic. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, anything we can do that makes it faster to sort of recognize the value of IGEL and also share some of the, uh, you know, the scripting and te the templates around uh, how to do things, I'm all for it, right? And if we can do that in a way where we kind of put an official stamp on a, uh, a on a custom partition and they can be shared um you know through in a, in a central location i'm for that i guess i'm i i love to listen to what you all uh think we should do in this regard right because custom partitions have been uh on one hand very powerful and they solve a lot of problems in terms of how uh when things aren't aren't standard or aren't built into the os that we can solve for them but then they also create as you all uh know who have, have put these in place like how do you kind of keep those custom partitions in sync as the os you know moves to the next versions so i think that's always been one of the challenges for igel is um they're powerful uh as a as a way to fix things but then they're also a challenge to kind of uh you know continue to endorse them and and manage them, right? Um, so I, I'm I'm very much here to listen to any of you smart people out there that have ideas on how we might do this, um, because obviously this is the value of the Linux. This is the the value of uh, how the software is built. Um, it's just a a matter of you know um, managing it. Thank you very Repackage much. downloads. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's not so simple though. It sounds easy, right? Um, Don't you yeah, make the it, complex simple, Jeff? Yeah. Isn't that the goal? Yeah, well. So well, uh, here's a good question for you. If I, Joe, had uh, unlimited money, what would you do first? Uh, I'd send a check to all the people in the Agile community. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so when we get a billion dollars, that's what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, with a big Jet Air signature, kind of like Trump did, right? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, I mean, honestly, I think uh, the, the heartbeat of every company is innovation, right? So I guess I would start to look at, you know, how can I gel? Um, you know, when you, if you were to go to Augsburg and see what we accomplish, uh, with so few, I think that would be my, uh, you know, real answer is like, um, how do we, how do we drive more innovation? And of course the innovation vectors, you know, are, are with these cloud pl players, Citrix, VMware, Amazon, Microsoft, right? I think the other issue for me, and obviously I came from a uh, marketing background and that was one of my first charters here was marketing. I still think one of IGEL's challenges is that there's just an awareness issue right we're not a household software enterprise name um and so you know how do we change that if we're going to have a sort of place in the history books as the inflection changes around you know windows on the edge 
uh, how, how do we become kind of this hyper innovative um, household name and enterprise software. So, uh, yeah, I would say spending the money, some of the unlimited funds you're giving me uh, in your godlike uh, question, I, w- I would spend on, you know, making sure that everyone knows about iGel. We see a lot of customers today, literally, right, that are sitting on thin OS or uh, Dell or HP environments, and they've got, you know, tens of thousands of these uh and they're, they're just frustrated as all get out, right? They're out of sync with Citrix or VMware. Uh, they can't make Zoom work right. And they've never heard of iGel. And then suddenly somehow through some fortuitous sequence, we find, you know, we find our way to, into the building or in front of these people. And, and it's like, you know, um, a miracle has happened, right? And, and, and all of a sudden they're not throwing away 15,000 devices, Um and, and, and Zoom is working or, or some application that they, they thought wouldn't work is working or it's in sync with Citrix and they can, man, they can actually manage the devices. So I think that's an awareness issue, right? Like it's like, okay, people don't get fired for buying HP and Dell. Um, and so they, and they just, they kind of go down this path, right? And they don't know uh, that there's another, another option out there. So yeah, I think that, and of course, just being a global company, right? We're not in a, uh, in the APAC region the way we should be. So I think that's where I would also, I would want to make sure, you know, we expand. Then I would jump in and take the next one. It happens from time to time that people in the community ask what can the community do to help IGEL? I'm not meaning especially in a special task, but giving feedback is, I guess, one of the biggest value we can get from the market for the moment. But are there other plans or other helping hands that IGEL would be happy to get from the community from your side? Well, I think uh, awareness is obviously like we get you guys that can help there, right? Just sort of, I know there's a lot of consultants in the community, a lot of people that... Um, are architecting these solutions and helping people. So certainly introducing us to those, uh, into the, into those opportunities, that's very helpful to us. Um, I think, yeah, the, it goes back to innovation also, right? Like you just said, the key thing for us, I think is, uh, I know Doug's talking about building a VIP program, you know, with a segment of this community so that, um, yeah, you have a real prioritized voice into our, um, development, Uh, teams Um, I mean that to me is the answer because I think about how did this little German company that's in you know not in the the world's hot center of technology right they're in Bremen uh, you know northern Germany and 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 even in in where we are outside of Munich it's just how, how did how did we get to this you know highly relevant highly innovative product well we did it through listening to people right and um so I think that's probably the biggest ask I have of the community is don't be afraid to share with us, you know, things you think we should be doing. We can't do them all. Uh, but you know, um, we sort of, you know, uh, crowdsource a lot of the innovation that's come into iGEL is what I would say. Um, and so if we start to hear the same thing over and over again, you're, you can expect that we will turn on it and, and make part of the fabric of, of what we're doing. That's what we saw the custom partition topic because on the last community meetup in Amsterdam where uh, you was also there, we had to uh, ask what the community is saying about the EMP and custom partition topic. And a few, say a few weeks or a few months later, uh, the new firmware with the custom partition back in the Agile OS workspace edition was there. So right. I guess that's the best example. Yeah, I mean, we listen. I, I would tell you that this is a very flat uh, mer- meritocracy kind of organization, and um, your opinion matters here. And I, I see all the people in the community, by extension, part of this Agile family. Um, obviously, great to see a lot of the familiar names on this uh, participant list. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, as far as the VIP thing, uh, we call it the Agile, or right now I'm calling it the Agile Ward Program, and Uh, this web pages are built, believe it or not. Uh, the list has been made, believe it or not. Now I'm waiting on resources, which is always a pain in the butt because you're raring to go and you're waiting for people to, or actually outside organizations to ship me things. So it's, uh, I hope we'll be able to announce it on August 1st, maybe send out the uh, invites uh, uh, prior to that. 
Uh, so stay tuned to all those uh, very active IGEL community members. Uh, looking very much forward to this. So that being said, here's a question that, here's another one, uh, is a question I asked Jed, uh, a few pe people within IGEL, when I joined the company, now someone just asked it within the Q&A, and that is, what about a SaaS offering? Why isn't there a UMS as a service, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, I think this is just, again, uh, a question of resources and where to put your investment, right? Because uh, obviously building something uh, and managing it and hosting it, um, it is something that uh, we, we think about. Um, it's definitely aspirational. I think today when we think about those uh, solutions, and in fact, this came up in our QBR that we had this week with the European theater, there's customers that are asking for this. So um, in, the, in the short term, kind of how we're, how we're approaching this is we do have some great partners. And some of those partners, um, you know, some of them are large global SI, some of them are, you know, Citrix Platinum partners that are trying to build managed services. We're, we're working with a few key partners in both markets to sort of, you know, uh, get to a place where they could um, deliver a, uh, a whole managed, uh, you know, experience with, with IGEL. I think this is definitely uh, something that we have to put more time and energy into and figure out how we can prioritize it. Everything IGEL does, just, you know, for those of you who are customers or may not understand our routes to market, we have this un, sort of wavering uh, commitment to partnership. And when, uh, when I say partnership, that means like when we shake your hand and say, hey, we're, you're going to sell IGEL, we're not going to come in front of you and like, you know, sell, sell IGEL at a, uh, and sort of create this destructive or conflictive relationship, right? So for 20 years, uh, Heiko has driven this sort of two-tier selling model that goes through distribution and value-added resellers. So that's also another kind of challenging moment is that, okay, you know, how do you build a, a sort of a SaaS model and then allow for the channel to also participate in that? Uh, you know, it, it's potentially a bit of a disruption of that, that market motion. So not that it's insurmountable, but that is um, another challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing that I would be happy to hear too, but are there any new products on the horizon from the Azure perspective? Well, uh, I mean, you you probably heard from Christian kind of all the things that we're, you know, we're, we're doing. Um, I, I shared the UD7 and the UD Pocket. Um, I will tell you that IGEL um, is work, you know, IoT is a fascinating space. There's a lot of, uh, you know, conversation about cloud and edge, edge and cloud, you know, intelligent edge, data on the edge with all these billions of devices. Um, clearly, all those devices need to, you know, um, if they're capturing data, they need to go to some kind of a gateway that then makes its way up into the cloud. So um, we're doing a lot of uh, work today around what a gateway could look like running iGEL, how it could, you know, um, how that data could find its way into these cloud you know, architectures. Uh, we're also looking at embedded, right? Like think about the, the beauty of iGEL, if, if iGEL OS could just be embedded on the chipset, right? Like and, and hardened into the, uh, in, into the chip. Um, there's no reason why that couldn't happen. Um, so, you know, we, we've got some interesting embedded conversations happening. I mean, these are far out, but these are things that, again, get me excited about where this company could go. Um, I think in the short term, you know, maybe some of the things we haven't talked about, it's really about a frictionless onboarding into these cloud environments, right? And so how do you, how do you create the easy button uh, for somebody that's trying to spin up iGEL and connect uh, to Windows Virtual Desktop or to Amazon Workspaces or Citrix and just making that experience frictionless, easy, uh, better than anyone else in the market. Some of the things you saw yesterday, hopefully around iGEL launching iGEL Ready, just this, you know, we have this massive uh, sort of distribution of, uh, of code that has to be kept in sync, right? And, and making that even better. Getting to the point where we're at day zero with Citrix. We were, I think, two days off on the last receiver. Um, our goal is to get this to zero, right? Um, same thing with Blast, same thing with Windows Virtual Desktop. So hopefully all of you saw iGEL Ready announcement yesterday. Yesterday we announced this program. Um, you know, close to 30 people in it initially, including Amazon, Mint, Microsoft, Citrix, and Amazon, uh, and VMware. And, uh, you know, that's, that's going to create a, a level of, uh, 
of, of, of crispness with the ecosystem partners that it should help everybody, right? Whether it's on the, the pre-sales, you know, proving out something, it's on the uh, sort of support side, um, the development side, that whole continuum, iGel Ready is going to create a much more uh, rigorous structure on how we ingest and manage and support these technologies. Um, and I would suggest to you, it's going to allow us to scale too, right? Today we have 90. We had 60 when I got here four years ago. My, my, uh, env I envision that that's going to go to 200, 400, 500, 1,000 uh, you know, people that are connected into this. Another reason for a quality app store. <laughs> that is exactly. <laughs> The, the well, I think about it, uh, Steve Jobs, he held up the iPhone, right? And he said, this is an amazing piece of hardware, but the real magic is the app store, right? It's all the things that are going to work on it. And that uh, Apple stood behind as um, integrated into the, into the hardware, right? So I think that in a way, maybe it's a little bit um, arrogant to say that, but that for us, you know, the, uh, launching iGel Ready yesterday with the showcase, and I think the app store is a natural kind of... Um, you know, follow on uh, at the right moment um, to, to, to delivering on this ecosystem. You got it. You got it. Um, the next question here, Jed, is in, in the App Store, sorry to beat you up over that. It's one of the, the biggest feedback we get from within the iGel mm -hmm. community is we love custom partitions. This is so amazing what we can do with the iGel operating system. How can we make it simpler? Why don't we have an App Store? So uh, we're just... Okay, well, I'm hearing you loud and clear on the App Store. I think <laughs> yeah, it's something I'll so go that's... back. This, I mean, that's why I'm on this call. I wanted to hear these things directly from all yeah. of you. Yeah. I think the other thing that, and I'd love your, uh, the, the, the community's feedback on this. Yeah, you know, we see there's sort of two winners in the management uh, plane wars, right? Um, that include every, all the devices that sit out there today, you know, from phones to tablets to, you know, all kinds of flavors. And that's Intune and, wor you know, Workspace One. And so uh, one of the things that we're also working on is getting you know sort of integrations into those two tools so that if you have a customer or you're a customer that's using one of those two tools you'll be able to see iGel uh, devices in those um, tools you'll be able to do a certain amount of um, of management uh, potentially inside of those two tools obviously you'll still need to go back to the console uh, to, to do some of the policy work or you know setting certain advanced functions up but just some of the basic uh, you know, administrative uh, workflows could be done inside of Intune, inside of Workspace ONE. Um, I'd love, you know, any feedback you have on that, um, the value of that, because we're seeing it from customers, but I'd love, love any input this uh, community has on it. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, guys, if uh, uh, gals listening, uh, if you have any feedback for uh, Jed on that, please use the the chat or the questions piece and just leave your content, uh, your, your comments, please. Uh, Jed, what do you see the future of the EUC and the old guards like Citrix and on-prem uh, remoting, right? Uh, versus let's say what Microsoft's doing, which is very disruptive. And where do you see iGel's place in that? I mean, I guess I would just have to, I mean, I'm very biased, obviously, in the, uh, my answer here, but I do believe that um, the edge and end user compute is like more relevant than it's ever been, right? When you look at this sort of what we talked about earlier, right, where you might have had sort of 10% of the population, you know, um, that had a, had a use case for, for, for delivering um, applications or desktops this way to suddenly you know, the entire world could use this technology, right? Um, shelter in place, work from home. Some of our biggest opportunities today um, with large banks and lar lar the largest companies in the world are to build their work from home business continuity um, yeah, solutions. I mean, we have one of, one of the largest retailers in the world uh, we're working with right now. They have 1.8 million people that need to be able to access their applications from home. So, um, I, I just think all of a sudden, you know, we've gone from, you know, situations where maybe there was 20 offices uh, that people were managing, you know, call centers and all kinds of things inside the four walls of those office, 20 offices, to where now all of a sudden there's 20,000, uh, you know, endpoints that are spread all over the place that could, you know, they could be logging on in a cabin in Maine or, you know, uh, you know a coffee shop in, in San Francisco, right? And like, how do you deliver 
all the right applications, data, you know, tools to those devices. Um, the edge has just gotten much more expansive, right? Um, and I think the, the, the world of end user compute, the products have matured, the uh, technology is there. Uh, to deliver this, right? And the three things that have always held back in user compute have been cost, complexity, and connectivity. Um, and certainly, you know, um, what's happening today in the cloud with Windows Virtual Desktop should drive cost and complexity down. Um, and, and connectivity with 5G, I guess we'll remain to see how, uh, how fast that can happen or how other technologies come into play, whether it's, you know, satellite delivered or however... However, we're going to bathe this earth in, uh, you know, um, in high speed internet, wherever you are. And I do think that's going to come faster now that um, we've seen the challenges of a COVID, um, right? We have kids that are out in the middle of nowhere that, that need to have internet, right? Um, to get their education. Uh, it's like water today, right? Um, so I, I think about those three things and I think, okay, End user compute has a very important role to play as we figure out, um, you know, this new architecture. And I think one of the other things I'd say to the audience, you know, people ask me all the time, well, everything's just going to come through a browser, right? And we're just going to get this all from the, the cloud, right? Do we really need all this, um, all this other stuff that control planes and this operating system? And I would just say, uh, you know, this is still a complicated um to, to, to deliver this correctly, right? And um, you need a, a secure operating system and, and you need this whole powerful ecosystem that's got validation um, and, and is in sync, right? Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question, Doug, but I, I, I guess the, 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 the time is now for all the people that have been you know, in this space for the last 20 years I'd say you're front and center, more valuable to your organizations than ever. I talked to a lot of people that were like, hey, I was on the phone with my CEO every day for three weeks as we worked through this. I've never had this level of visibility in my career. So um, hopefully that's encouraging to all of you, right? That you were a big part of how you kept your company solvent um, and operational through this. I would ask one question that came more or less in a direct uh, private message. Um, and more a personal question, I guess. But since you joined Angel a couple of years ago, is there one choice, sorry, one choice you made company related that you regret today? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this, this is probably a funny story, but obviously, um, it ended well, but I probably wouldn't have done the uh, disrupt event inside of the VM world. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it ended fine, and we're, our relationship with VMware is as good as it's ever been. Um, yeah, I had a good good meeting with Baroth, and um, yeah, we ha we have uh, very positive things happening inside of VMware. But that was a little bit of a setback. Um, sometimes being bold and disruptive, and uh, you know kind of, uh, yeah, we got a little ahead of ourselves there. And um, there was a sequence of things that happened that were unfortunate. Um, we, we didn't do it out of mal, mal uh, intent. Um, but if I was, I would say that was a very public thing that if I could take it back, I would. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Well, it's a, uh, <laughs> that was a great story, though, Chad. Uh, um, it was a uh... It was something I will will never forget the rest of my life. Um, I think it turned yeah. out well. I think. I, think I mean, at the end of the day, we 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 prevailed through that whole whole debacle. But yeah, and we had done all the right things. There was fifty people inside of VMware that were that knew about our event and were even speaking at the event. It wasn't like we did it under the cover of darkness, and that it was like. Uh, I forget the word that people use when you come in and tailgate an event. Um, it, it wasn't that at all. Um, it was really more about the fact that VMware, like for whatever reason, wouldn't create this track of very specific end user compute at the VM world event. And so we, we decided to take matters into our own hands and we got kind of uh, mixed up with the global event people that are ruthless. And uh, yeah, it ended badly that, that day, but ultimately, you know, never give up and always kind of believe in people and their intent. And yeah, you know, we prevailed through that process and, it was it was challenging moment though. 
I think, uh, Jed, we're, we're at the top of the hour, and I know you need to go too, but I love that you, you ended with never give up, uh, and that's just sort of the, that's your mantra, right? You know, it's like always someone upsets you, you work harder, you know, if there's the troubles, you just never give up. Uh, I love it. So uh, I'll give you the last word, and then we're going to head over to Christian and, and get deep dive into some uh, advanced topics. Well, I'll just close by saying thank you very much. You know, I think one of the things that makes IDEL different than any any other company I've ever worked at is like the passion and emotion that like pulsates through the company, not only our people, but our partners and our customers. And, uh, you know, I see it every day. And so, um, you know, that's just a great honor to be part of something like that. And, uh, you know, we want to be approachable. We want to be human. And, uh, you know, so that's my other ask is, you know, um, I'll put my email address in here. Um, I'll, I'll put my phone number in here. And, you know, this is, this is the type of company this is. If you have, you know, text me, call me, email me. I, uh, I, I want to have a relationship with all of you. And I thank you for, uh, you know, being, um, being convicted about the iGel technology and uh, you know, if there's ever anything I can do to help you, please let me know. And uh, you know, be kind to each other. This is a challenging moment for the whole world. So um, lead with kindness. Good things will happen. Jed, thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, folks out there listening, he's not joking. He'll respond to you. And if he hasn't friended you on uh, LinkedIn, that was definitely uh, by mistake, right, Jed? You, I think you're. <laughs> There's not one, anybody I know that has uh, more connections on LinkedIn than him. So, yeah, well, uh, thank I, I, uh, so I want to have a relationship with all of you, and uh, sometimes that's harder than uh, it looks. But, um, you know, please reach out if I can do anything for you. Uh, and I uh, appreciate, um, appreciate you, Doug, and Sebastian and Christian. Have a good rest of your uh, session here. Thank you so much. I do. Uh, thank bye you bye. very much. Thank you, Jed. Okie dokie. So uh, the CEO has left the building. So we're left to our own devices. <laughs> her, 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 her. So uh, uh, if anyone needs to take a quick break, uh, maybe a bathroom break or something, please do. Uh, I'm going to ask Christian a quick question and then we'll get started. Sound good? So Christian, we did actually, believe it or not, have one question for you within the chat. I don't know if you saw yeah, this. Yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> Is there a bar in behind you? Is this yeah. not weird? So there's a roommate. There's, no, there's a there's a pool up bar right here. But uh, yeah, Mr. Bermuda. Oh, yeah, no, there is a bar right here though. Okay, okay. I thought they meant like bar, you know, not. Oh bar. no, there's a, there's a bar on top of the fridge, but uh, it's too early okay. for that. It's only 9 a.m. Okay. California right now. I was gonna say the only people I did sit through E two E, and if you guys uh, ever get a chance to sit through an E two E uh, in person, definitely do it. Virtual is really great too. And the control guys were doing shots of limoncello at nine o'clock in the morning. I don't know how, and they did like ten of these things too. I don't know how. <laughs> Every time you ask a question, they'll take a shot of limoncello, right? So the questions That's kept awful. going to see if the guy would pass out. So that being said, buddy, I know you have a full uh, uh, thing here, you know, full session. We don't want to uh, make you rush. So if you want to get started, you know, yeah, first we... and foremost, thank you so much for doing this for us. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, thank you for the invite. Um, I try to get on the community. I know I've been, I, I'm MIA on there from the IGEL side. Uh, I do have my, uh, my alias that I utilize a lot uh, through, through the community. Um, I, I do a lot of work for the advanced services team. So, um, but we do have people on our team that are, are represented on there as very much. Uh, so we have uh, Renee Rauker, uh, we have Lars, Ivan, um, and then we also interact a lot with the uh, customer support team, right? So Chris Bates, um, David Sieber, Sebastian, we've talked plenty of times that we've gone. So um, I'm going to go ahead and kick off the presentation here. Um, I'm going to tell you how many slides I have, so that way you guys know how long it's going to really take me. Um, let's take a look here. I am at 47 slides, so I'll try to go quick, but not go too quick. Um, so Doug asked me to go ahead and come online today to sort of talk about our best practices. So that was sort of a, a catch-22, right? Because uh, everything going on now, um, we, we are a new team here at, at IGEL. Um, so my name is Christian Bermudez, uh, Senior Solution Architect for the team here in North America. Um, I came from a EUC background, specifically healthcare. Um, 
banking and higher education. Um, and then I also did a uh, whole lot of VMware, a whole lot of Citrix, a whole lot of single sign-on around Improvada, and a lot of printing and a lot of dictation. So um, expertise is around uh, those areas there. Um, came on board last um, June now. So I've been here almost a full year. Wow. Um, and then we have a team of currently seven in the U.S. and three in um, Europe. So um, so team is combined of a lot of EUC backgrounds, right? So we've uh, sort of all derived sort of creating uh necessarily engineering standards we don't like to use the quote unquote word best practices we're trying to sort of change that terminology there um but one thing that does make our team special is um not only knowing igel but we know igel plus citrix igel plus workspaces igel plus vmware um understanding the components around healthcare, right? Are you guys using dictation? Are you guys using scanners? Are you guys in a clinical workflow? Are you using an amateur workflow? Uh, when it comes to banking, you know, is it a call center type workflow? Is it going to be a, a teller type workflow? Um, are there going to be pin pads slash, um, you know, uh, SIG pads going to have to be redirected? Is the application running through, uh, for example, credit and scimitar or XP systems, things like that. So, um, we, we've been able to be pretty broad on what we've learned and brought to the table from our team, which really helps us um, just understand the user experience, right, regardless of the vertical. Um, so that's one thing, um, you know, we, we pride ourselves in, and that's one thing we have our offerings around, you know, professional services and our TRM, our, our technical relationship management, uh, where we try to get a little bit more um, technical than, than the, the typical stuff that you guys have seen. Um, so everything in this presentation um, is going to be around based on our experiences and some of the recommendations we've gotten from IGEL product management. Uh, we've been really tight with IGEL product management and development on sort of developing reference architectures. Um, yet what we've seen in the field, though, we, we tend to be a little bit more conservative just because, uh, you know, we want to make sure we walk away and leave you guys with the, uh, you know, the right things and, and the, everything on a silver platter running correctly. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick off the presentation around design considerations. So this stuff is all new. Um, you will see some of this stuff come out on the knowledge base from our product management and our technical writing team. Um, so I'll cover a little bit here. So we've gone in and sort of done some design considerations around the UMS sizing. Um, so it's gonna be based on the sizing, small, medium, medium with HA, small with HA, and large with HA. Um, there is an extra large, uh, but we do like you to go ahead and contact us depending on how large you guys want to get and how some of those design aspects go. Um, so sizing on the small will be up to 5,000 devices with the embedded database. Uh, medium will be up to 15K devices with an external database. Uh, and then small and medium with the HA will be up to 15,000. Uh, those will also entail with high availability and load balancing. The large will be up to 50,000 uh, with high availability and load balancing. And then of course we do have our remote offering, which is the ICG, which has been going through, uh, it's a rigorous growing pains throughout work from, from home or this whole WFS, uh, WFH um, thing going on. But uh, we are seeing um, everything we've encountered so far really be pushed to that product and make it the better product it needs to be, so. So from a design consideration on the specs, um, we do take an ultra conservative look right now. Uh, we've I've gone back to product management. Um, so everything that we have typically is gonna be based around four CPUs, 12 gigs of RAM. You'll notice that the uh, large goes up to 16. And then uh, on the hard drive size, it's gonna be the OS plus 50 gigs. So um, again, if you guys are going above that 50K, please contact us. Uh, we wanna make sure you guys have a, a supported design. Uh, we have had instances where uh, designs have been shown to our customer support when the uh, uh, project came in and they had to get um, re-architected. So make sure we want to get you off the bat there. Um, one thing around the ICG gateway or the ICG um, right now, um, our recommendation from our team is going to be four CPUs, 16 gigs of RAM. Um, depending on the version of ICG you guys are on, 
uh, we may do some Java heap um, optimizations and customizations around it. And then one thing to notice right now is the max number of devices that will be publicly announced is going to be 2,500. And uh, I will show you some uh, slides um, where you guys can actually set that now uh, in new version of UMS. So. So one thing to keep in consideration is what we do, right? We don't want to come in and build the UMS scenarios to be sort of wonky, right? So, um, you know, same same data center, same type of, uh, you know, multi-data center conversations we can have, but depending on what your guys' uh, latencies are going to be, that's some of the, the, the design aspects we have to keep in consideration. Um, devices connected through LAN, uh, UMS, right? If we have, uh, you know, devices that are coming through MPLS lines or things like that, you know, we have to keep some considerations of do we point those to the actual UMS or do we utilize some type of an ICG connection uh, to, to make that socket connection? Um, one thing to take note is uh, boot storms, right? So that's another thing we have to take a look at. Um, and then also understanding how firmware updates work, right? Um, and, and I have a slide deck or a slide here that we'll go over on on updates as well, sort of some scenarios and sort of the, the best practices or recommendations we give. Um, the other piece is going to be the UMS backups, right? We don't necessarily ever want to keep those on the host because if the host goes down. Um, and, and then also, um, you know, how we manage backups through a master of tasks and things of the sort. And also, we're always going to be considering, uh, you know, best practices based on the IB, IGEL KB. Like I said, there will be some new uh, documentation that's going to be loaded on the KB that will have uh, some of this new reference architecture coming from product management. Um, some database sizing considerations, right? Um, so the number of firmwares you guys have is always going to go ahead and truly sort of dictate how, how it impacts the database size. Um, you know, I've had some customers where I've done health checks and they've had 20 you know, firmware is built in there. So how do we handle that, right? Um, so we typically, our team would like to keep you guys around five firmwares, right? Uh, production one, one that maybe you guys can roll back to, one that you guys are testing. And if maybe if you guys have a couple of private builds or some type of automation or, or new integration that has to be there. Um, number of devices and profiles does have minor impact, uh, which is, something that people often think it's it's the opposite. So um, it's very small in size on that one stuff. Some of the other things that we do see a lot of database impacts are our AIT, which is our um, asset inventory tracking, right? That's adding a lot of data to it. Um, another thing that happens is people don't actually do some of the administrative tasks that we have set forth to be best practices. So. That also um, needs to go ahead and be in consideration, and I have a slide on that as well. Um, and then rule of thumb, right? 50 megs per firmware configuration, 100 KB per profile, 100 KB per device. Um, some of the larger environments that we have running 35,000, 40,000 devices, um, you know, database size is maybe a gig and a half. So um, not necessarily massive compared to some of the other systems that are out there that I know folks are used to. Um, one big thing between uh, that we've really focused on has been understanding latency, right? Um, folks do want to build that multi data center designs for some of the enterprises. Um, but like all applications, you do have a limitation on between the database and the UMS servers. Uh, so we do want to go in and keep that sub 20 second milliseconds. Um, latency between the servers, if they are multi data center, is going to be 50 milliseconds. Um, same thing for the load balancers. One thing you'll notice on the new designs for the load balancers is that the UMS and load balancers are going to be running together. So um, that sort of takes away that, that extra layer there. Um, and then higher latencies between the device and UMS um, have little impact on performance, although you may see some issues around check-ins for the devices, right? Uh, some folks are used to seeing everything green. Sometimes they seem red. You know, what, what is really the, the happy medium that you guys got to have there? Um, you know, if I have a device that's sitting here in the U.S., but my, U, uh, my, my UMS is in the U.K., you know, is that device really going to go see? If I do a round-trip latency check, you know, it's 120 milliseconds. I have my milliseconds 
set to 100 on check-ins, you know, you know, those little things are, are some of the things we have to take a look at. Um, I won't bore you guys with net reports, but just understand there's a lot of net reports going on, right? Um, when we add in the load balancers, we are going to add one more port into the uh, into the mix, which is 30,002, right? Because of the HA and the load balancers will now um, utilize both ports as there. So, and I'll share this. Uh, Doug will be sharing out this presentation to go ahead and go through this. So, um, you guys will be able to see some of the pieces there. So this is um, hop into the actual reference architectures. Um, these are all going to be um, qualified or, or, or imported, right? Um, so one thing you'll notice here is uh, these are the designs that we sort of get from our practice, right? Our design sessions that we do. Um, so from a small configuration, uh, you'll notice that there's 5K, right? We have single UMS with a built-in database. Uh, we will be reaching out to the ILP to do its licensing needs. And then if you do have an optional um, IGEL or ICG need for this, um, we recommend three ICGs to go ahead and handle the 5K load, um, you know, and plus one. Um, when there is multiple ICG configurations, uh, they do get a little bit more, uh, I, I would say complex on the configuration, not necessarily complex, but uh, it, there is some caveats that you have to do. And I do have some slides, uh, I'll dig into that one to sort of show you guys how to handle multiple ICGs, how to handle the failover and how to handle sort of the, the enrollment URL that you guys will be utilizing. I'm going to stop for a quick second. Any questions through that would be one to type in yet, or um, I'm the type of guy who likes to be interactive. Maybe you would just want to give me a quick no. I'll go ahead and continue. <laughs> yeah, if anybody has any questions, please use the Q and A piece. Uh, you know, sort of uh, ask anything, or as I like to say, let's see if we can stump Christian time. <laughs> You'll stump me a lot, but don't worry. I usually have some type of good response. It's, the, it's a, you know, the whole thing is that nobody knows everything, but it's about who how many resources you have, right? Exactly. And, uh, and uh, if you know how to use those resources, that's what separates the, you know, the good from the bad. So, uh, but no questions as of yet. Oh, right, here's cool. a question. Now, here's one question here. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, a bunch of them come in. So it took them a <laughs> second to, it took a little bit of the type, right? You know, so uh, uh, when the internal DB is used, uh, no need to define the DB port, right? Uh, David, I think there is a DB for a port for the for, for Apache running locally. Uh, I can grab that, but I know there's nothing that we have to define locally um, when we actually do the RM admin configuration. Then here's more of a comment from good old David. Uh, uh, this is really helpful since we just purchased four days of advanced services time. So uh, that's great, that's great. Uh, Awesome. So most likely it'll be myself or uh, Jason McCollum, but uh, yeah, welcome to uh, start working with you, David. All right. So I'll go ahead and uh, I'll continue on. So thanks for the, uh, the feedback there. And David, I'll, I'll find out from that. Uh, so I'll go ahead and hop over to our next design, right, which is going to be our uh, medium configuration. Again, single UMS. In this case, we are using an external database, um, Oracle, Postgres, MySQL. Um, from our perspective, we recommend Postgres or Microsoft SQL. Postgres has the best performance due to the uh, Java database connector, right, and how it interacts with, with Postgres. Uh, but we know that there is a large, large, large uh, footprint of Microsoft SQL out there. Um, so, you know, definitely that's what we typically see, I would say 99% or 90, probably 90% of the time in the field. So, uh, again, uh, supporting the... ICG is 15K, you know, simple math, right? 2,500, multiply, divide that by 20. So definitely I would add more there. Um, and then we'll, again, go back and cover how we sort of handle the URL, the multiple ICGs and how those devices interact with ICG uh, and then can ultimately get back their, their data from the UMSs. Um, as we go over to the small and medium configurations, right? Um, now we're adding in more UMSs, we're doing uh, load balancing services plus the UMS on, on those devices. We are looking at an external uh, database. Um, in this case, I have Microsoft SQL here going over port 1433. Um, and then 
utilizing some auto discovery pieces, right? So like the RM and uh, IGEL RM server, which is be set up uh, technically on your uh, DNS side. Um, there are some other ways to do it. We can utilize the DHCP scope option, uh, 224. Um, so there's a couple ways to go ahead and get some of the automation and self-enrollment for these devices. Um, but again, nothing too crazy. If I would have the 15K, again, 15 divided, 15K divided by 2,500, that's gonna tell me how many ICGs I truly need. Um, one thing to note on uh, some of these configurations that uh, you will see here too, for external devices, you do want an external type of you know remote repository to house your files and house your uh, firmware. Um, since we'll want to make sure that some of these devices can actually pull updates and, and pull down custom partitions and things like of the sort. David, put some more pay questions in here. So let me take a look. Uh, has difficulties. Let's see, I'm just thinking LT is there particular you know, defined network to prevent this. Um, you know, with the new ILP um, and, and moving from 6.3 and above, uh, we've really taken our time to make sure that the customer, when they're doing their POV, um, has everything whitelisted correctly. Um, so we try to make sure that they have gone through the whole you know, fashion of getting licenses uh, imported and, and then distributed to these devices correctly through ILP and then uh, from device connecting to UMS to make sure it's getting there. So um, licensing is a whole different conversation, but I can definitely have a, you know, a sidebar conversation around that um, and making sure that, you know, folks understand on top of using ALD to make sure that the ILP is connected correctly to the, um, to the UMS instance. May I just add just a few, just two things on that? If someone yep. is interested in uh, getting more information about the uh, automatically license deployment and the network topology, like you, David, would be great to write a PM. Or if you want to go to the uh, kb.igil.com, there is a specific uh, specific uh, page where every port, where every server which is reached out by the UMS is listed with port configuration too. And if that shouldn't be enough, uh, just search for SUSI, so S-U-S-I, .agile.com. If that one is, shouldn't be enough, just reach out to us on asking the community and we'll send out a POV checklist we created for, for customers. So it's nothing related to us. It's uh, just a documentation that we send over to, to customers as a POV phase is starting, that every network question that Christian is covering perfectly with this showcase is there explained a little bit uh, more specialized for the different use cases. But if you're interested, just write a short PM and I will send over to that. Yeah, and, and it is cloud hosted. So, so I know some customers that I had, um, when they did their whitelisting, they wanted IPs um, versus URLs. And so um, sort of have to put some security exceptions around that because those are cloud hosted. So they could potentially do change IPs. Um, they are dynamic. So, um, you know, you know, we do have to take a look at that piece when we're doing our engagement. Uh, but it's something definitely will, you know, we have to do off the bat just to make sure that devices can get you know, licenses. I, I am not one of trying to use demo licenses or starter licenses when doing our projects. Um, as we know that our stuff is going into production. Thank you, Sebastian, for that input. Um, so one thing, we'll now move over to large environment, which is our HA, max device is 50,000. This is where our bread and butter of, of our team has been lately, right? So we're uh, looking at D3 UMS servers, right? We are N plus one there. Um, Again, in this case, I'm communicating to Microsoft SQL database. Uh, it isn't always on. Usually what we recommend is always on. Uh, we are doing some stuff around Active Directory and enablement on, always on. So uh, that is forthcoming, but not here yet. Uh, one thing you guys will notice that's sort of a little more uh, outside the uh, the box thinking uh, is the amount of ICG gateways, right? Um, if I have 50,000 devices, I gotta be able to support them. And I do have customers that have said, with COVID, I have to be able to support 25,000 devices inside my UMS and outside the four walls. Um, so how do I do that? So this has sort of been some uh, some change in the way we think, right? So now we have to go ahead and build out the ICGs to also match the um, the amount of device that can be supported inside the, the four walls. So um, again, UMS load balancing service, services um, going on there. If we do use one UMS, 
Uh, we typically will do a remote um, profile that will go ahead and make sure that all devices are aware of all three of the UMSs. So that's part of our uh, profile management and, and device management that we, we cover. So I'm going to hop into some of the engineering standards. Uh, a lot of these are going to be screenshots of the um, of the component and sort of what we set best practices to be sort of you know to keep with. Um, so there won't be a lot of actual verbiage, but it's more screenshots, and then I'll talk to it. And again, um, if you do have engagements with us, I'll, I'll be covering this. So I'm going to go ahead and start off on the UMS administration pieces, right? which is going to be you know, the bottom tab of, of your UMS, and then you guys get to see everything going on here. Um, so the first one I'm going to cover is certificate management. Um, this one's been a double-edged sword for us. Um, typically, we like to keep our internal self-signed cert. Um, it keeps it simplified, right? We understand that the, the, valid, the validity of the, the device uh, or the certificate is going to be long enough for the device to actually keep around. And then... Um, we know that the security on it is at least heavy enough to, to pass the security audit or an exception audit type thing. Um, we do have folks to try to use the public cert. Um, the only issue there is that if the public cert root CA and intermediate CA aren't on our base OS, which we've seen sometimes that happen, um, the device will not connect back to UMS. And so you're, you're put in sort of this, uh, La la land of your device not being able to communicate, and then you have to go do a master reset and, and then bring it back in and, <clears throat> and go down that headache. So definitely the recommendation here is to stay with the self-signed cert uh, and go from there. Uh, we have had some customers come back and say, well, can we use the self-signed uh, or, or a CA signed cert from our internal? Uh, answer is no, that is not supported as of yet. Going down to the device network settings, um, one thing we typically want to go ahead and come on here is turn on our automatic registration, right? This allows some of the automation to make sure devices can get booted on the network, pull the A record, find the UMS server. Once inside the UMS server, we can go ahead and put it into a staging folder. And then from there, we can go ahead and sort of drive what we want to do. Do we want to go ahead and do upgrades? Do we want to rename it? Do we want to get a structure tag? Is there any customizations we need to do to that OS prior for it going to the correct directory? Um, for the end user to actually have their, you know, use case or their, their workflow that they need. Um, one change I do here on the device request, we do go up to 150, right? Um, we feel that that's a comfortable number to go to. Max is going to be 300. Um, but again, 150, I feel like that at least gives us enough enumerations or less threads to go ahead and go through and do device upgrades or, or pushes or something of the sort, right? So, with, uh, um, you know, a, uh, an infrastructure our size of 30,000 devices only pushing 50 per, you know, per thread or concurrent threads. It's going to be a minute before a lot of things go through. So we want to try to at least help push that along a little bit better. The last piece is going to be the adjustment names of devices. Um, this has been sort of a headache. Um, so we try to do our renaming specifically from the device, um, and which, you know, we typically do from a staging folder with a rename profile type thought process. Uh, that allows UMS to go ahead and pick up the names correctly. Uh, we ha have some instances where we have a rename on a rename script and we have to do the bottom one first. Um, and, and so you just could create some caveats and your names could flip flop. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll go into the UMS and you'll see your device name on the UMS side. On the left hand side, show the correct name. But if you actually go look at the client ID or identification in inside the summary, it could still be our generic ITC um, name or or something that you guys don't necessarily want. And I know there are environments where those names are very important. For example, in healthcare, uh, I know if, if the client name doesn't match uh, what's in some of, uh, some of the EMR uh, records locators, um, the device, you know, the application won't even run. So that's some of the things we have to keep in mind there. <clears throat> Going down to this network server tab, we sort of keep our defaults there. Um, for some of the larger environments that do have um, devices spread out throughout, for example, all North America, I have bumped up the online check response time. Uh, but again, that's really up to the customer and also seeing some of the integration or, or the, the layout of the devices and where they're all communicating from. Um, so that's some pieces we'll take a look at when we actually take, 
you know, come in and, and evaluate the uh, design aspect of the, the environment. Uh, I did bypass gateway because we'll go and go back to that. Um, so this is a big important one right here, minister of task. Um, I wish these would come in a checkbox by default to allow users just to say enable, 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 but you actually have to go build them out. Um, so these are the ones we typically configure on our side. Uh, so we typically want to see a monthly report of all the devices uh, that's emailed to us. Um, one is we want to see how long the device has been around, if the device is still active, um, if I need to do any type of licensing monitoring, because uh, one thing that is uh, needs to be kept in consideration is going to be licensing and the device from IOP. So if the device gets a license, but it's deleted from UMS, it does not delete it from ILP. So there has to be some type of understanding of how to go clean up that license repository from the ILP. Um, logging data, process events, you know, all these things just add additional things to the database to keep it dirty and necessarily don't need to be there. So uh, if you do have an interaction with the advanced services team, we do have a best practice how-to doc that will deliver on that one. Um, I'm willing to share it to the community because I, I feel like everybody else is, so, Doug, I'll, I'll clip that cleaned up or I'll work with Chris um, based on the customer support team to see if there's anything he needs to add um, and then definitely distribute that to, to the community as well. So I think it's something that all, all our customers should be uh, turning on when, when running UMS and, and IGEL. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, default directory rules. Um, use them. They are magic, right? They do allow for a lot of automation and self um, configuration to take place, right? Um, sometimes that, uh, yeah, you know, we run into environments where not everybody can touch every single thing and we know that. So uh, we've, we've run into some uh, customers where they've just sent the pockets out to not people that were technical and they just say, plug them in, boot them up. And, you know, don't worry, they're gonna get configured. So what we did in some aspects there is we utilized some structure tags, we utilized some IPV lands, we utilized some views, um, and we were able to do some configuration. So as those devices come online, we force them to a reboot, we force them to give them a structure tag, and then from there, the default directory rolls to say, hey, this device is in XYZ location, it needs to get this configuration, boom, it got it, and then within 15 minutes, we had about 450 devices up and running. Um, you know, zero touch, which was something that the customer wanted. And and it is the option that we can do. We just gotta be um, pretty matriculate on uh, when we do the configuration and the testing around it, but it's it's something we uh, utilize heavily on the advanced services side as default directory roles. I'll take a quick break there. Looks like I got a couple of questions. Uh, do you have any profile templates? To customize the agile desk, uh, fuel screen savers, brand new Citrix workspace. Um, so I don't necessarily have any templates, but I. I if you want, if you want, I can take over these two questions. If you want to go, uh, if you're going through, through the presentation, because I can answer that with the agile community uh, customizing guide, where we have okay. some information Perfect. on the same stuff. So if you want to, to to go through your presentation, I can easily take it over if if, if it's fine for you. Sounds good, perfect. Thanks, okay. Sebastian. All right, next it's gonna be Active Directory. Um, please, 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 please don't over just keep it as simple as using the local admin account. Uh, please go and set up Active Directory. Um, reason why we typically wanna make sure that we do a role-based access, access control to the UMS um, too. Um, with the new versions of UMS and web coming out, some of those default users that we used to be able to use are no longer going to be able to have access. So we do want to be able to sort of understand the roles and, and, and users that we need for each of the components. So, um, so please, please, please utilize Active Directory. Um, get that stuff in there. Build security groups out. Get a service account going. Um, treat this system as if it was your Citrix infrastructure. Treat this system as if it was your VMware infrastructure, right? Um, you know, allow that thought process and that role-based access to, to, to utilize there because we'll want to go ahead and be able to do access control from a device perspective for users to, for example, help desk or your, your tier two, your tier three engineers. 
Um, from the remote access pieces, um, you know, we do want to go ahead and be smart. So we will enable basically all the secure pieces here. I will log users uh, for secure terminal and for secure VNC. Reason I do that, somebody gets a call and I have to do some type of uh, audit, I at least have that data, right? So uh, definitely something we want to enable there. From a logging perspective, um, if we need to enable logging, yes, let's enable it. We're going to go ahead and log administrative data, logging, message and body details. Um, if we, we do want to get a little bit more granular, you could do the log event settings. Uh, it is pretty granular, so you do want to go ahead and sort of understand what each one is doing. Um, typically, that will be coming directly from support if they want you to do that information. So um, sort of come, come back full circle on that one and get that info from them. From the miscellaneous settings, uh, we do want to go ahead and, and enable user login history, last active device. Um, so that is good to have, right? Because we can actually look up username in the um, main UMS lookup field um, and notifications we'll want to keep there. Um, I go ahead and set the product management pack or the product packs for notification to be available for 20%, uh, right? From a thought process, you always want to have at least 20% of availability to make sure licenses are there. Um, you don't want to run out of licenses because I know one procurement through your organization most likely takes a while. Two, um, you know, cleaning up licenses does take a minute, right? So it's not necessarily, uh, I can go do it in five. It's probably going to be a half hour day, uh, you know, hour day, two hour day to, to go in and clean those things up. Then from the UMS features, um, please, please, please um, take a look at utilizing template profiles and master profiles. Master profiles, be very careful. I would only turn these on if you have our team engaged because um, you could put yourself in a world of hurt and utilizing master profiles and overrider step citing some of your profiles that you guys have currently in production. Um, and then utilize your recycle bin. Um, don't turn that off because once you delete something, you at least want to try to go be able to rec recover it if possible. Um, and then I've seen people not have that on. Next thing I know, they deleted a whole folder, a whole directory, and the next thing you know, those devices are gone. No questions asked. So uh, don't put yourself in that situation. Don't put your customers in that situation. While the device will continue to run, you'll have no management on it. And not knowing that information gets a little rough. So, so this covers back to that Active Directory piece. The reason why I say use Active Directory, because one is we do want to utilize folks logging into UMS using their Active Directory username and password. So for example, this is my other lab I have. I have my admin account logging in, so I have super admin access or administrator access to UMS. Um, you do have to set access control for the user on those three different locations down there. So UMS administration suite six, UMS network and global configurations. If you don't send anybody there, Potentially, when they log into the UMS console, they will have any, nothing there. They just be blank. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you'll see that we are able to go and log in with my UPN and my username and password, and, and I'd be able to go through um, and, and go on my way there. So that way, we're not utilizing that local admin account from the database, uh, which is, in our, in our eyes, a, a big no-no. Any questions throughout that whole um pieces so far not from my side at least <laughs> <laughs> anybody on the community there looks good so far cool i'm going to continue to roll no. so i'll continue on so um now we're going to roll over to sort of device management, understanding UMS and how we want to keep it pretty, right? So um, we had a group of engineers on our side, right? From the SE side, customer support side, the advanced services side, and TRMs, and we sat down. And we're like, okay, what do we really want to have our UMS look like when I log into it, or anybody logs into it, or customer support gets a call and they have to go take a look, right? So what we built is sort of this groundwork of, of making it look pretty, right? And having logical sense to it. Um, so we broke it down into essentially what we have from the setup configuration. So part one can be sessions, anything that has to do with, you know, 
logging into Citrix, VMware, Workspaces, Improvada, Healthcast, WVD, um, you name it. That's sort of how we've broken it down there. Then we go from accessories, user interfaces, network devices, security, um, hardware fixes. Um, for example, some devices, for example, Dell 3040s, uh, need to have a pulse audio fix. So we throw some stuff there. And then we also created a tool bin. Um, you know, anything that has to do with debugging, anything that has to do with um, third party custom partitions that we can throw on there to do maybe like Conkey or things like that. So, um, but it gives the user a visual indication of what is this used for and how do we need to go ahead and configure it. So um, something definitely we, we have started to use and preach uh, a lot on the advanced services side. Um, and then you'll see sort of how we break it down. Um, so in this case, we have, these are standard dynamic profiles. That's sort of what we call them. And then from there, you'll see that we break down, for example, our sessions into a lot more granular pieces, right? So for Citrix, um, depending on how you guys are launching, I would do a profile there. I would then do a separate profile for Citrix redirection, HDX, Unified Communications. That allows us to be granular. And then also if we need to go in and configure something for a specific use case, then we can and it won't affect every other profile that we push. Because we know when we push a Citrix profile update or VMware profile update, if we have to affect one little component of it and it's be utilized by everybody, it could potentially kick them out of their sessions too. So we don't want to do things like that or that sort. Master profiles, same thought process here. Um, our thought process on master profiles is this is going to be as static as possible. Think of it as Active Directory and domain control, uh, you know, domain policy, right? What needs to be static? What doesn't have to change, right, at all? Uh, in our cases, we are going to do NTP. We're going to do remote management for the UMSs. Uh, we're going to probably move our uh, some of our security pieces in there, right? Our root password, our user passwords, uh, removing shell access, access, things of the sort is where we'll use master profiles. If there's another use case that is very useful, then we will use it, but it's going to be very uh, based on the use case and the workflows that we need to get the user for. Is there a way to set domain authentication in the UMS? Um, not as of yet. Um, I believe the web console may have something, but I have not tested that piece out. So that's something we can go in and get some more feedback on for, for you. All right, so let me go ahead and click through. So one thing that we also utilize a lot on our team are templates and keys. Um, Reason why, I don't need to have a million profiles to do the same function. Um, I've run into this a lot with time zones, right? Um, we can set one profile to do the time zones, and then we can actually set a template key inside of that to utilize what time zone we want to go to. Um, so one thing you'll notice here is on our NTP configurations, there is a template expression in the lower right-hand corner. So this is the time zone location. So I know as my customer comes in and I need to feed that for, um, you know, that Eastern time zone or that Western time zone into that location. I will assign the profile to the group. Um, and then in the subdirectory, based on location, geolocation, I will go ahead and find the actual template key. And I have a sample that I'll show you guys here in, the, in a second. Former customizations, um, wallpapers, start buttons, all the sort, right? We, we do a, a pretty good job of making sure that the environment looks very customized to the your what you guys want it to look like. So we'll brand it with your wallpaper, your start menu if you guys, uh, or start button if you guys have one. Um, you know, we typically want the user experience to look very customized to the organization. Uh, one, I think the organization gets a little bit more warm fuzzies around it. Um, they understand that it's built for them, not necessarily just out of the box. And two, uh, if you guys are migrating from another system um, and it had a look and feel, we can try to mimic it, right? So I know folks don't like change, so if we can move them from one system to another and it looks very minimal on the change, they're going to accept the change in the technology a lot easier. So uh, that's been one thing we've noticed. So breaking down devices, 
Um, I know some folks like to be flat, some folks like to be multi-leveled. Um, so we basically did both. Um, so we come in from a device company, a uh, company name. Um, reason why is uh, we're able to do things at a top level, sort of same thought process of Active Directory, um, and also allowing ourselves to uh, apply profiles to that piece. Um, so what you'll notice here that on the left-hand side, I have my geographic location, my company name, and then I have location A and B. Um, instead of location A and B, you know, for example, if you're a hospital, it could be floors. If you're um, distribution or logistics, it could be sites. Um, it could be zones inside of the site, right? Because I do have, you know, for example, a large shipping company that they have within their warehouse. They have about 16 zones and they want to be able to manage it by zone depending on who is working where <clears throat> or what type of devices they have in that area. So um, we, we've broken it down to sort of have this thought process here. One thing we also do is a big staging folder, right? We always try to push everything to our staging folder first as part of our device onboarding before we push it to the actual location. Because if we need to do any profile update or, or firmware updates, which is the biggest one we typically run into, um, that's where we'll do it. So we keep it simplified. And then also we'll most likely do some tools there, like a terminal or rename um, profile so that the help desk or, or or the tech is can can go ahead and do their process before moving it to, to production. As we come over to the right hand side, you'll see that I have some profiles associated to the device that I have in question here, but I'm doing it on a couple different levels, right? So like I said, my master profiles are associated to my company name, right? Those are my static ones. I have a firmware that potentially could be for that geographic location. So for example, there have a, um, you know, let's take healthcare, for example, it's a hospital. Uh, that hospital has a specific wallpaper that shows their hospital name and their building. So that's where I would sign it. Um, they have custom uh, things that have to do with Citrix. That's where I would sign it. And then of course, if I need to go ahead and then to go back and, 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 be a little more granular on, on my lockdowns, and then that's what I would do at a company name. So we do have that thought process there. One thing you'll notice though, is then we'll go into the location, and if you see there, I have my time zone location. That's when I'm taking advantage of that, that profile with the, with, with the template key, right? I have one profile. If I were have my location B, I could use a different time zone. If I could go down to location 2A, I could use a different time zone but I'm not always using another profile or having to create another profile to manage. I'm just doing one. So that's been a big, big thing that we've seen in our health checks that folks aren't utilizing. And I think that's a big piece of, of IGEL that could make uh, simplification of, of profiles be a lot easier. Uh, for example, I just did a health check for an organization and it was 197 profiles. <clears throat> and I, I think after we do the restructure, we're going to get them down to maybe 35. So um, that keeps it a little bit more manageable for folks. Any questions to there before I sort of hop in there? How would you just uh, um, I'll come back and answer that question here at the end of this, because I think there's a slippery slope on that one, especially if you use views. Um, so I'll come back to there. Um, so that's sort of the outline of understanding some of the things that we've done from building the infrastructure, how we set up the UMS, what we do from the administrative side, and sort of now, okay, hey, I need remote access, which has been the hot topic lately. Um, I know our folks, Udo, and some other folks did a, a great presentation on ICG. Um, one thing that I think they missed on uh, was multiple ICGs. So I wanted to just add a little tidbit to, to add on to theirs um, because I think it's important and also it's something that we've seen a lot on our advanced services kicking up since this COVID uh, uh, nightmare has kicked in, I guess, um, is how do we handle multiple ICG configurations? Um, <clears throat> from the technology perspective, we don't, manage or we don't support load balances yet third-party load balancers so you know we have to be a little tricky on how we handle it so i went through and, and configured uh, a multiple cloud gateway situation on my environment here to show you guys so i have two cloud gateways um, my regular ums and i've configured them to come in so i have my icg1 these are actually hosted in azure um, 
and then I have a GoDaddy DNS record for them. So my new bay will ICG01 has been bounded. You'll notice that my host name and my external host names are the same. Um, one thing you'll notice when I go to the next slide is that I do have another name for a host record that's going to be my enrollment URL, and that's sort of going to be my round robin URL that I've configured for core enrollment. Um, so when we do configuration of O2, same thing, host the record is going to be O2. Um, one thing you'll notice with the new version of UMS on this version is we now can have a max concurrent number of devices. Um, prior to that, Apache has a top limit of 10,000. Um, and so we never really had a way to, to configure that. So uh, this is a feature they've put in for us. I'm extremely happy for it because it helps me and our team um, sort of understand how to design these pretty well and allow failover to take place correctly when the socket connection is being requested. Um, so that looks like the configuration in there. From the certificate perspective, I've come in and just done a self-signed cert internally because one, I don't feel like buying one, two, is I need to get requests to allow that many expense then, and that's usually a uphill battle some days. Um, so I'm using the internal. Um, so what you'll notice here is I have a round robin URL, which is the icg.newbayworks.com. So that way the certificate knows it's a good uh, SAN name. And then I have my certificate names for the other two, my Newbay ICG and Newbay ICG02. Uh, if you guys are wondering why I use Nube, Nube is cloud in Spanish, so I was trying to be a little trickery there. But, um, so what I've done here is I've come over to my uh, DNS location, uh, which in this case is GoDaddy. I've created a round robin DNS utilizing the two IP addresses, right, for the devices. Uh, I have set those to 600 seconds in the time to live just because I always want to make sure that the round robin's getting updated you know, more often. And then I have my A records for my each of my um, my ICGs in this case. Um, the <clears throat> the ICGs do need to be resolvable externally in order for this to work as well. So keep that in mind. So once we have that, I come to my device. I will register with my round robin DNS name, which is icg.newbitworks.com. I've used a structure tag, right? So that way I can go in and utilize some uh, some pre-configured default directory rules to get this device in here and configured so that way when the customer or, or you send this out to your user, they don't have to worry about it being in a state where it's not usable. So I've come in, I've used my password to go in and come in. In this case, when you are using a self-signed cert or a uh, root or enterprise CA delivered certificate, it is gonna ask for your fingerprint. Um, if you are using a public cert, it will not ask for your fingerprint because it is trusted. Um, once that's there, you'll see that it's connection ready. You'll see that I have a device here up and running. My device is connected. And inside of WFS, you will see uh, a hidden ICG config file. So we'll see that there is a enrollment or a location for where the device is there. So this is a, oops, sorry. This is the, uh, let's see if I can annotate this. You notice that I do have my, my enrollment there. And then it does give me a server list of both devices. So if I were to take new big ICG one down, the device itself would actually roam back over or not roam, but fail over to O2. Um, and that's been tested in trials for many, many customers, but that's something that we, um, we now have a design aspect on it, and we also understand how our RM agent and our ICT agent or um, utilizes that that this this configuration there. Let me turn it off. Awesome. So, what is my Try to clear my annotation, but I think uh, it's still there. Let's clear this. There we go. So from a device, uh, best practices on deployment. So I know uh, this is always a topic conversation during our our um, de deployment or our design phase and, and sort of understanding what's going on. So there are a good amount of ways to push IGEL or, or the OSC. Um, and as we've gone, in the last year, I think three of these are new. Um, so that's that's some big change there. Traditionally, boot stick, right? Um, we have 
many, many customers that have done it, you know, 7,000, 10,000 and then by boot stick. Um, they have the workforce. With COVID right now, not necessarily a story. So it's, it's, it's getting to be a little bit trickier. Um, so our dev team has come out with um, an OS converter for Windows. Um, it does work decently. Um, for what the process is, I think um, our new SCCM <clears throat> uh, or OS converter is pretty good, especially if you're using Lambda, Altiris, any of those type of things, right? Um, to, to do package management, to push them. It seems to work pretty well. Um, for me, uh, if we're using SCCM, I think we can get a little bit more, um, that's what I'm using, uh, technical or, or, or I think cleaner way of doing it. Um, we do have a new SCCM add-on, which is going to be using a WMI, a WIM push to do. That's in beta. Uh, from what I've seen, I think that's going to be the preferred mechanism um, just because it's cleaner. Um, we do have a SCCM Pixie image um, process that we've done on on our side from uh, from the advanced services, which we've done a capture image, uh, and then we use a Pixie image with uh, a DD, WinDD tool, and that will actually overlay the image uh, on top of the volume. And we've seen that work pretty well as well. The only thing about these some of these thought processes is that it, it is required to have Pixie, right? So if the device doesn't have Pixie enabled, you got to get that there. Um, if not, you know, if you're touching the device, why don't you use Bootstick? You know, it really comes back to those type of thought processes um, and, and the amount of time you want to take take there. Um, then lastly, we have the IHL OS deployment appliance. Um, I only utilize this in single VLANs, PLCs, right? I think the for, for managing the amount of uh, deployments that you want to manage, if you have an SCCM environment already out there with distribution points, uh, distro sites, you know, take advantage of that, right? You're already utilizing, utilizing some of the file uh, capabilities and, and DFS and things like that for the repository. So uh, you only have to push the image once and, and to, to, to one location and it'll replicate out. So these are some of the pieces uh, we'll, we'll definitely keep in mind to, to do. Um, I also have a structured way to do it with Landesk, um, but I did not put it up there because that's sort of a, uh, a customized how-to. But if you have any questions around that, uh, ping the community, let me know. And we can definitely try to see what we can give you guys from a from a methodology perspective. Uh, updates. Um, I know this is something that we've been running into lately um, a lot, uh, especially from going from OS 10 to OS 11. So uh, I did want to catch a little bit on you guys. So from internal connected devices, anything connected to the LAN, use UMS. You have the ability to. Uh, it's probably going to be the easiest and, and fastest way to do it. Um, and now, if you have UMS on-prem, but you have to do different geographical locations, this is where I would say it's getting a little fancy. Uh, use an external SFTP site, use an external facing IS site, Apache site. Utilize the ISP over your, your, your MPLS or, you know, or that type of thought process. Uh, worst case scenario, use buddy update. Uh, one thing about buddy update, though, is, is keep in mind is that the one of the devices in that location has to be updated manually first, and then it can turn into the buddy update. And depending on how busy that branch or that location or that site, that call center is, um, it, it could take a couple of days for the rest of the device to actually take place. Uh, but with Buddy Update, you do have the ability to go ahead and do multiple Buddy Updates to be the, the master to, to pull. And so that really helps. Um, updates from OS 10 to OS 11. Um, definitely, I think it's distributed on the community, but I can give you the video. From the digital distro video, I, I did a whole seminar on that. Uh, so please review it. I think it's good data. I think it, it gives some pretty proper outlines. Um, you'll understand what's there, especially from uh, the changes on the licensing. Um, also, understanding how if you do have an IGEL device, how the perpetual license changed, how the main support changed, and you'll have to go ahead and go through some of those things through your sales team. Um, but it's something we want to keep in mind there. Um, Last piece is going to be <clears throat> hosted UMS. So we do have some customers that are hosting this stuff in Azure, are hosting AWS, um, and not necessarily want to do UMS pushes. So again, this is where you can be fancy and use those, those devices there. Um, I know the community has a document on doing S3 uh, share file. Um, I think I have a document I could share out for the folks that want to try to do an SFTP with Azure Blob. Um, and there's also some IIS 
blog stuff that you guys can utilize. So anything that has questions through there, let us know, and I can definitely try to share some data around that. Uh, and then now for the ideal device connected to the device, uh, the ICG, same thought process, right? Um, I've done some testing with some of the ICG stuff. So one thing you guys will notice, oh, I didn't notice with my ICGs and you guys won't know is ICGs aren't hosted in the same data center. So my UMS is hosted here in California. I have an ICG in, in Azure West. I have an ICG in Azure Central and I have an ICG in Azure East. Um, and then each one of those has their own file repositories. So we do have the ability to do that and depending on how the latency is between my ICGs and, and my UMS here, which I think my max latency that I have between my stuff is 60 milliseconds. So I'm comfortable running at that. Plus it's a demo environment, so I get to play around with it. Um, but there are some cool ways of doing this stuff. And, and, and you know, we're, we're starting to see a lot more customers utilize the external facing hosted stuff. One, it's cheap. Two, um, it allows the device to actually download some of the firmware a lot quicker, especially from the work from home for some folks that have the, the better um, connectivities from their home. Ah, so I think that's the majority of the stuff I had. Um, again, um, Doug, thanks for letting me sort of put this together and sort of combine my thoughts on what we've done from advanced services and, you know, some of the conversations we've had with the SE team, this, the, you know, the, the EMEA team, um, you know, we're, we're definitely tight with, you know, we have a very tight, uh, I would say brotherhood of uh, family feeling here of how we communicate uh, what we do. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you. Christian, thank you very much. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, it's always, uh, you know, I don't get to be a techie very often, and and uh, it was really, really great to to listen to you go through that stuff. I understood a little bit of it, <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, um, I definitely understood it, or I definitely loved it, and uh, I hope everyone else that loved it. We do have that last question. Did you answer that one? Did I miss that? Um. Yeah, so I mean, we got to be careful a little bit on on doing that. We can we can apply some configurations on views depending on what you are. I would say definitely reach out to the advanced services team if you if you don't have that. Reach out to the community um, if you want to post in the community, and then Sebastian or Doug if you want to forward that to me, and, and let me know who it really is. I can just send them an email um, and they go down that conversation because it, it does get a little tricky. I'm one not to apply some configurations through views because it sets it on the device versus the actual folder. So if I ever need to rip that device to somewhere else, I have that stuck there and I have to do a cleanup of that. And that sometimes becomes caveats that I don't want to do or have the customer go in and do. Sebastian, yeah. do you have a comment there? Um, just a short comment. I guess what he's speaking about is not only applying a profile to a view or a, through an admin task. In that case, if you have a template key and this template key is covering a specific value, you cannot apply this value to a view. I just had to double check that one, to be honest. Yes, I believe you <laughs> can. I, be, I believe you can. You have to actually create a, a, a true... You have to go create a true profile, so it adds additional overhead. I mean, I, I had to run it. I ran that through a structure tag one that I did, um, which I ended up coming back and doing structure tags differently. I ended up doing a script for structure tags. Uh, seemed to be running a little bit cleaner and, and easier to, to to push. But yeah, I, I agree that we can't do that yet in our UMS. It doesn't allow us to do that from the view side. Um, also, you got to be a little careful with views because that does add some overhead when you start doing that stuff on the on on the UMS side, especially if you have thousands and thousands of stuff and that job runs. Got to be a little careful there. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you very, very much. Um, hey, there's one more question if we have time. We'll take this last one and then we call it quits. We want to respect people's time. And here in Germany, it is a little bit late. Please install uh, ICGs. Please have a good configuration ICG. Um, so you can actually build enough secondary ICG on top of the first ICG. We'd have to be a little careful on the, well, we've got to take a look at the certificate. All, it's all based on the certificate base. Um, we do have a way to go ahead and do some migrations dependent on what version of the, um, of the UMA or I, um, IGEL OS you have, because we do have the ICG-config utility that's built into some versions of it. If not, we can push the binary to it. And it allows us to move the ICG or the device from one ICG to another ICG. Um, but yeah, we do, we do have some ability to do that with a profile. 
Perfect, perfect. And if you guys have more questions, please just uh, share them in the uh, IGEL community. Uh, these guys will see them. Uh, so will, you know, the, all the other folks. Um, we are up to, what are we at right now? 3,991 members. So we have nine more members to 4,000, uh, which is pretty, pretty cool. So uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, guys, if you like this, please let us know. Uh, if you have suggestions for the future events, please let us know. You know, uh, uh, we're fire, firing arrows in the dark uh, on these things, trying to guess what you guys want to hear and, and present that to you. So, you know, this is for you. Please let us know what you would like and we'll make that happen. And uh, Christian, thank you so much. Sebastian, thank you so much. And Jed, wherever you are right now, thank you also. But most importantly, thanks everyone for listening. And we'll get this thing edited on up and posted. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, what else do I say? But have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you very much, guys. See Bye. you. As we say in Germany, tschüss. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs>